Okay guys, in this video we're going to talk about intermolecular forces or IMF. Uh, we're going to try to define them and then also kind of work our way through how they interact with each other. Okay, so first thing we want to make sure that we're comfortable with is this idea of what is an intermolecular force. Okay, so when we talk about intermolecular force, we're talking about a force between molecules. Okay, not a force inside the molecule but between one to the other okay so inside a molecule we have ionic bonds and we have covalent bonds but between them we call these things IMS and we have four different names for them London dispersion, dipole-dipole, ion dipole and then hydrogen bonding okay so a little video here uh, kinda corny but it does give a good overview of how these different forces work so here we go there are four types of intermolecular forces all with funny names they are ion dipole interactions dipole-dipole interactions, London dispersion forces, and hydrogen bonds. Ion-dipole interactions exist when a solid substance made of ions is dissolved in a liquid consisting of polar molecules. For example, when sodium chloride, an ionic solid, is dissolved in water, a polar liquid, the solid salt crystals break up and form the ions, Na positive and Cl negative. The positive charge on the polar molecule moves towards the negative ion of the salt and vice versa. The term dipole. Okay, so if we take a look at this idea of ion dipole, um, what we see here on the screen is that we have sodium, and sodium is an ion, and when sodium dissolves in water, water actually will come around and actually encapsulate the sodium with all the oxygen facing in, and they'll create this kind of attraction to that sodium. That attraction that we see, that we're drawing that there, that is the ion dipole force, okay? Same thing happens with chlorine. The only difference with chlorine is that the hydrogens tend to want to attract to the chlorine the reason being is that the hydrogen is partially positive, whereas the oxygen before is partially negative. So the positive charge of the sodium attracts that partial negative of the oxygen, and the negative charge of the chlorine attracts that positive part charge of the hydrogen. Okay? So to get ion dipole, you need to have an ion in solution. So we need to have chlorine ions or sodium ions in solution. And you need to have a polar molecule with it. That's the term dipole. Okay? Well, it's just another word for polar molecule. Dipole-dipole forces result from the slight charges on the ends of polar molecules, causing them to stick together. It's the dipole-dipole forces between water molecules that cause bodies of water to have surface tension. These forces are relatively weak because the charges on polar molecules are pretty small. But even the small polar charges are enough to create a tangible force. And when you do a belly flop into the pool... Ow! Get it? Polar bear! Ha ha! Get it? Polar bear? Polar? No? Okay, fine. You definitely notice the dipole-dipole forces between the water molecules. The polar molecules try to hold together. London dispersion force. Okay, so dipole-dipole, what we're seeing is anytime you have a polar molecule that has a partially negative side to it, and a partially positive side like we have in water that they actually attract. So that's your force there between those two things. Okay, It comes from the basically attractive forces where your negative attracts your positive. So with this oxygen, because it is partially negative, if there's another water molecule close by that's partially positive, there will be an attraction between those two, two things. That's a dipole-to-dipole -dipole force because there's no ions present. Okay, Next one's our London dispersion. Forces are intermolecular forces that result from fluctuating instantaneous dipoles. Uh-huh. I'll explain in English. You can't have dipole-dipole forces between nonpolar atoms and molecules, right? Because there are no charges attracting the molecule to each other. But a guy named Fritz London... Who? Fritz London. He figured that since nonpolar molecules can become liquid, there must be some intermolecular force at work between nonpolar molecules. So he came up with this idea of instantaneous dipole movement. Fritz London figured that even nonpolar atoms like helium might sometimes have both their electrons on one side of the nucleus for just an instant. 
old Fritz called this coincidence instantaneous dipole movement. For just an instant, a normally nonpolar atom or molecule is polar. Then, of course, the electrons move and the atom or molecule isn't polar anymore. But when one atom becomes polar for an instant, the force of its electrons on one side repels the electrons on the atom that's next to it, making that one polar for a moment by shoving both of the atom's electrons to one side. This can continue in a kind of domino effect until a whole bunch of atoms are polar for an instant. When this happens, you get a real quick and temporary dipole-dipole type attraction between normally nonpolar particles. London dispersion forces operate between polar molecules too, increasing the attraction between the polar molecules. Okay, one thing to note here is that London dispersion forces, they are the weakest of all the forces, and they do work inside a nonpolar molecule. However, like the video just stated, even if you are a polar molecule, you can also have London dispersion forces. So one of those cases that's rare in science is you can actually say that London dispersion forces always exist for every molecule. Okay, so if I ask you what type of forces some molecule exhibits, the right answer is always London dispersion if I ask you for any of them. If I ask you for all of them, it might be London dispersion plus something else. If I ask you for the strongest, okay, um, then you need to compare those, but London dispersion forces will always exist, but they may not be the strongest one, okay? We're here in London. The dispersion forces have begun the bombing, pushing our electrons to one side, which makes us whole for just an instant. Hydrogen bonds are intermolecular forces too, and guess what? They deal only with hydrogen. When a hydrogen atom bonds to a strong electronegative atom, it forms a polar bond. The electronegative atom pulls hydrogen's electrons toward itself. The hydrogen, with its electron pulled away from it, has a tiny positive charge. It is then attracted to an unshared electron on another atom. This attraction, found in molecules like water and hydrogen fluoride, is the last type of intermolecular force. Okay, so... Um, when we talk about hydrogen bonding, uh, make sure that we're not confused of what's the bond and what's the, the intermolecular force. So if we notice, for hydrogen bonding to happen, it only works when hydrogen bonds with nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And the reason being is that nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are the most electronegative substances. So they have the biggest pull. So they can generate hydrogen being partially positive, or all of these are going to be partially negative. But the polarity here is going to be really, really high which creates a really strong force. Now, um, chlorine is also real high electronegativity, but it's just too big of an atom. So this, it just works with nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, those three. Okay, You must have a covalent bond like you see here and here for this to happen. So you had to have a covalent bond. Okay, um, First, once you have that polar covalent bond, then you can actually form the hydrogen bond between two different molecules, okay? So you need that covalent bond first, covalent bond first, and then you can form the hydrogen bond between those if you have a covalent bond between hydrogen and nitrogen or hydrogen and fluorine or hydrogen and oxygen, okay? These make by far the strongest, okay? They're actually so strong that in a lot of disciplines, like in the biological world, for to say, sometimes they actually treat them like a true bond. Even though they really aren't, they are just an intermolecular force. They're weaker than covalent and ionic. Some people actually treat them that way, okay? So as we go down to, next, to our next slide, one way that we write these down, and I've been kind of doing it on the iPad for you guys, but the way you represent these forces is using a dashed line, okay? So you have the water molecule, a water molecule, a water molecule. So the straight lines are all our covalent bonds, and then the dotted lines between them ind indicate our intermolecular force. Now, in this case, we see on our image here, these are all hydrogen bonds. So between this oxygen and this hydrogen, this is a hydrogen bond. This intermolecular force is a hydrogen bond. Okay? You have a covalent bond that helps create that hydrogen bond, but it's actually not a hydrogen bond. So this is still just considered a covalent bond inside of here. This graph will help us out a little bit with this. So your, your types here are listed from weakest to strongest. So London dispersion are your weakest. Okay. All molecules have them, 
Um, they come from what we call instantaneous dipole movement, or basically the random movement of electrons that can create some attraction. Okay, um, but it's also the only one that nonpolar substances have. Dipole, dipole, and ion dipole are essentially the same force. Um, the difference here is ion dipole needs to, to dissolve an ionic compound in the solution to make it happen. Okay, both of them are middle of the road for strength. You need to have polar molecules, uh, and then ion dipole. One of those things that attract will just be an ion instead. Hydrogen bonding is kind of the big deal here. It's the strongest guy, very high. Um, keep in mind it's still weaker than all covalent bonds. And only works with polar molecules where hydrogen is attached to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay? So if that's the case, then you can generate your um, hydrogen bonds. Now, once we can identify these different bonds, what we can do is we can start to look at some different physical properties that happen for our different molecules. And really, what happens is, is boiling points, viscosity, surface tension, uh, vapor pressure, volatility. Uh, there's numerous physical properties of different molecules that really what rely, they rely on these different intermolecular forces to basically determine what that property is going to be. Okay, so water has a melting point for a reason because of its certain intermolecular force that holds things together and so forth. Okay, so in our next segment, we're going to talk about the different uh, physical properties that uh, IMF actually controls or affects as we kind of go through. All right, guys, that is it for this video. Uh, our next video, we'll start talking about melting and boiling points and how IMF affects that. Thank you.